distinct ecological character and make it unique from the rest of the state. You can often find her roaming around in Cary State Forest. Absolutely. Hey. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can you hear me, Walter? Okay. Uh, thank you, Adam, and to the rest of the Ixia chapter board for inviting me to speak tonight. And thanks to all of you for coming out. I'm going to talk about something I am very passionate about, um, edible plants. Um, but I'm actually a surf instructor by trade. Um, so don't take anything in this presentation. I'm not a doctor or a botanist or a nutritionist or anything like that. I'm just a native plant enthusiast. Um, and I am a forager. And so I was wondering if anyone here tonight considers themselves a forager right now. Okay, Adam, support. Oh, excellent. I don't think I've met you guys. And Alice. All right. Very good. If wow, you Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but if you didn't raise your hand and you're like, I don't know if I'm a forager. I don't think I'm a forager. I just wanted to ask if you have ever eaten a wild blackberry or perhaps um, sucked on the end of a honeysuckle blossom. Because if you're now shaking your head like, yeah, I've done that. Well, you are a forager. Um, you might be retired, but you are a forager. Um, and the way that I got into foraging, what does foraging mean? Well, I collect and consume wild food, mainly plants, but also mushrooms, food that I did not grow or purchase. Um, and I got into it, and I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit this to the Native Plant Society, but I got into foraging because I'm not a very good gardener. <laughs> live up on Amelia Island. I live really close to the beach. My backyard is basically a sand dune. It's a really harsh environment, a lot of sun, a lot of salt spray, and growing traditional produce, tomatoes, cucumbers, things like that, very hard, requires a lot of soil amendments, it requires a lot of supplementary watering. I tried, I failed, I tried, I failed. I gave up and I started to look around my own yard and there's an undeveloped lot next to me. And I started to look around some of our natural areas and say, well, if I can't grow this traditional stuff, what did people eat here where I live on Amelia Island before the convenience of Publix or something like DoorDash? And it turns out they ate a lot. Um, and so one, see if I, perfect. The very first plant that I personally discovered was Yalpon holly, and it was growing in my own yard. Um, my partner mentioned to me that he had heard it was called the black drink and that it could be used as a tea substitute. So we harvested some, I dried it, I roasted it, I drank it, I did not vomit. <laughs> um, it was pleasant, I liked it. And so I started to look at the entire world in a little bit of a different light or through a different lens. I then found elderberry followed by beautyberry and then winged sumac followed by oyster mushrooms. And at this point, I think I've consumed somewhere upwards of 60 wild plants and mushrooms all foods that had been consumed by indigenous people on that island for hundreds and thousands of years, and foods that you would never find in the supermarket, unlikely to find at a farmer's market, and so flavors and traditions that are pretty much lost. Um, and this was kind of troublesome to me. So along the journey, I learned a lot, and I've been doing this for years and years now. Um, and one of the first things I learned was to look for mulberry blossoms in the spring. And I learned when we have had enough rain in the summer to flush out chanterelle mushrooms. And that hopness marks the start of autumn where we are. And pine needle soda is a wonderful way to ring in the new year. I have learned that it takes a frost to make the lion's mane mushroom fruit out, that you will never 
beat wild animals to pawpaw fruit. <laughs> <laughs> and to check underneath the leaves of passion flower for caterpillars and butterfly eggs. Foraging has allowed me to have a deeper relationship, a more intimate experience with nature than I ever had before. Tonight, I am going to share just a few of my favorite wild edible plants and some of the ways that I like to use them. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, you should always do your own research before consuming wild plants. Don't take my word for it. And my goal for this presentation is not to educate you on identification, but maybe to inspire you to look at these plants, not just as something nice that you might add to your native garden, but plants that are part of our natural history and part of our heritage, and they can be a part of our cuisine. Um, I have the presentation divided up into seasons. And so we're gonna start here in fall, and we're not gonna talk about pawpaw because you're never going to find a ripe pawpaw that a raccoon or a possum or something hasn't eaten first. <laughs> One thing that you can find, and it's quite abundant, and it's ripe right now, are our wild grapes. Uh, we have three species of wild grape here in Northeast Florida, probably a couple of hybrids as well. But there's two species that I see very regularly. One is the leaves in the background. That's what I call summer grape. I believe it's Vitus acetabalis. And then the fruit in the foreground, which is our native muscadine. And I use these two species of grapes very differently. I like the summer grapes for their leaves. They're quite big. They can be three or four inches across. And you can use those leaves just like Mediterranean or Middle Eastern cuisine. But the leaves of our native muscadine are actually quite tiny. Um, it would be nearly impossible to cook with them. But of course, it puts off this wonderful fruit, which you can eat fresh and it tastes delicious. But also you can make jams, you can infuse spirits with it, you can make syrups, vinegar. Uh, uh. <laughs> okay, but what if I want to go down? You're, you're missing the hair. Okay, sorry. Some of the things that I have done with grapes. Uh, stuffed grape leaves. If you want to do stuffed grape leaves, you want to get the leaves in the spring. The fruit is ripe right now in the fall, but grapes have um, a lot of naturally occurring tannins in them, and the leaves get more and more bitter as the summer and season go on. So collect your grape leaves early. And as you see them come out, you can freeze them if you don't want to use them right away. You can also pickle them or can them, put them in a jar and keep them. Um, but just like a dolma, if you've ever had a grape leaf at any restaurant, um, with the fruit, all kinds of things. Of course, you're going to make muscadine jelly because it's absolutely delicious. But one thing about muscadines, they have that very um, thick kind of tough skin on them that that's not a grape that you eat the skin on. So you juice your muscadines, use that for whatever you'd like. Take the skin, it still has a ton of flavor in it. You can infuse it, put it in a jar of white wine vinegar. If you like cocktails, you can put it in vodka or gin. Let it infuse for like four weeks, six weeks, and then you have this really nice muscadine flavored um, vinegar or spirit. Okay, one day I'm gonna learn. How to use this. Uh, I call this presentation I Eat Flowers, and one of the flowers that I find very pleasant to eat. So a lot of flowers don't really taste like very much of anything, but one that's actually very nice to eat and pleasant is hopness or American groundnut. And I will plug our field trip on Sunday morning. We are most definitely going to see meet and greet hopness. It's flowering right now. Um, but it's a wonderful native plant. The flowers have a super pleasant, um, sweet key flavor to them. They taste very much like a fresh key taste. 
Uh, the bean pods can be eaten fresh or cooked. And then I, for the most part, typically avoid harvesting roots and tubers of wild plants, but hopmas was an incredibly important um, food source for indigenous people and then colonists and settlers, and they ate the roots, which to me look a little bit like a yucca um, or a potato, and it's a starch. And so you can kill them, boil them, you can mash them. Um, I sliced them and fried them. Um, flowers, you can put them on a salad, put them on an open fish sandwich, eat them fresh. It's a, just a wonderful um, native plant that we have. And then winged sumac, also flowering and fruiting right now. Um, you cannot miss these bright red droops. They're that really gorgeous uh, maroon burgundy color. And they're not actually berries, they're droops. And so there's very little flesh inside of them. It's not something that you would pop in your mouth and eat but the skin is covered in a substance called malic acid. It's very tart. Uh, it's a little bit citrusy or acidic. Traditionally, a lot of people use it um, for something called sumac aid or sumac lemonade. Very easy to make. You just take that cluster of fruit, put it in a jar of water, let it infuse for a few hours, and you have a sumac flavored beverage. Uh, but my favorite thing to do with it is to dry it. And so sumac spice is a really popular spice in Mediterranean and Middle Eastern cuisine. You can actually buy it at the grocery store, um, or you could harvest it and dry it yourself. And it has that not lemony, but citric and sort of acidic, nice flavor to it. Um, it's great to make like you can make like your own lemon pepper, but like a sumac pepper blend. I sprinkle it on deviled eggs, sprinkle it on crackers. Um, I've also used the droops to infuse sugar. So same thing as making the beverage, shove the head of the fruit in a jar, fill it with sugar, let that sit in your cabinet for several weeks. So then you'll have this really nice sumac flavored sugar. You could use it to decorate cookies, you can put it in the rim of a glass. Um, fancy. And then finally, for fall, our own wild persimmons, um, very similar to persimmons that you buy in the grocery store. Those are Asian varieties. Ours are a little bit smaller, but they're every bit as sweet. And they're starting to blush right now. They're starting to get just a little bit of color on the fruit, and they'll probably be ripe Next month or so, so keep your eye out. Little uh, orange colored orbs on trees. They're best eaten fresh. And really, has anybody ever had one of our wild persimmons? They're like candy. I mean, they're so, if you get one that's ripe, and when they're ripe, if I'm being honest, they're not particularly beautiful. <laughs> when they're ripe, the skin starts to kind of wrinkle, it gets kind of translucent, the flesh inside. Is very soft, um, but incredibly sweet. And if you don't want to eat them fresh, you could make persimmon butter. It's kind of like apple butter. I've used this in persimmon flavored donut, pecan rolls, and then my favorite thing, oh, you can't see my thing, persimmon barbecue sauce. Um, I like making fruit-based barbecue sauces, and persimmon is a particularly good one. And then, we will slowly transition into winter. We're actually not going to talk about acorns, but they're a great protein source. It's a long, lengthy process to process them. Something also difficult to process, but well worth it, are native prickly pears. And the fruit of prickly pear is typically right in late December, early January. It takes a long time. This plant flowers in like the spring and it takes forever for the fruit to ripen. And you wanna pick it when it's that nice uh, purple color. You can eat the fruit fresh, but you can also juice it, syrups, vinegars, wines. The fruit and the pads are very popular in Central America. Um, the fruit's called tunas there. If you've ever heard of tunas there, it's 
this fruit. The pads are called nopales. And that's what the fruit looks like when you slice it open. Um, I mean, Nepali tacos, but the fruit there is so prickly pear, its name, it gets its name very, um, that's a literal, it's quite prickly. Um, I had a little note on the previous slide. I use tongs, kitchen tongs to harvest it, just flick of the wrist and they come right off. But I also use tongs in the kitchen um, each one of the fruit have little tiny spines on them. So hold it with the tongue, slice it in half, and then I use a spoon to scoop out the flesh. And then you can do whatever you'd like with the flesh. You can juice it, you can make prickly pear jam, um, prickly pear wine's very popular. And the bottom part there, that's prickly pear key lime pie. And then Hercules Club. I wanted to include one that um, maybe would people would be like, whoa, what? Um, do, does anybody have a Hercules Club in their yard? Is there one in Native Park? Yeah. Do you have one? In your, yeah. Has anybody ever put a leaf from Hercules Club in your mouth? So Hercules Club, um, common name, another common name is toothache tree. Um, and if you were to put, this is a very mature leaf in the image, those are large leaves. If you were to put one of those in your mouth, it um, will numb your mouth. It'll be like a really tingly numbing sensation. Um, that's why it was called toothache tree and it was used um, to numb the mouth. But that sensation, that tingly sensation, it comes from a molecule called hydroxy alpha sanchul. And that molecule um, is in our Hercules Club. It's in the southern um, Xanthus Island species wild vine that they have down in central and south Florida. It's also in a plant called prickly ash, which they have in the northeast. And it's also in an Asian Xanthus Island. Um, and it's where we get sea on pepper from. So the leaflets, the very young leaves, and if you have a female tree, the fruit, um, and it makes this little tiny berry, um, can be used for all kinds of things. They can be dried and saved in your cabinet to use as a spice, but they can be used to flavor drinks. You can make salts with them. You can make compound butters. I um, took a couple of the small leaflets and made some Hercules Club salt cured egg yolks earlier in the year. And then Hercules Club pickled strawberries. I think for sure more people here would have a Hercules Club in their yard. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great pollinator plant. It's in the citrus family and it's the host plant for the uh, giant swallowtail butterfly. More common maybe a little more appealing or appetizing to people is our um, native meadow garlic. I thought Jenny might be here. Um, anytime Jenny Steibold's here, she has meadow garlic bubbles and she's like always trying to hand them out to people and get them to grow meadow garlic in their yard. Um, it's a wonderful native edible to have in your yard or to harvest um, from the wild. If you find it, the entire plant is edible. And so underneath the ground is a little teeny tiny bulb that looks like a small onion. Um, but then it puts up a stalk and that stalk can be used like chives or like how you use green onion. And then it produces in the photo there, underneath the little flowers, those are aerial bulbs. Um, it produces all these aerial bulbs and those two are all edible. And then some of the ways that I've used it before, um, chopped up like a chive or like a green onion for flatbread. But then I also took a bunch of those aerial bubbles and I pickled them this year. And that's, um, it was a fun pickle. It's great to eat it just straight out of the jar. It was really cute on little pickle and relish platters. It was also really nice in like tuna salad or on top of a deviled egg or something. Um, and then honey fermented uh, little bulbs there. So I filled that jar with the aerial roots, covered it in honey, left it on the countertop for three or four days. And then I had this like meadow garlic infused honey. 
um, that you could use to like brush on roasted vegetables or maybe like a, some sort of hot roll or something like that. And then in the bottom, men are garlic pickles. So I took the pickles and I'm from the South. I was born and raised here and I love pickles and I love fried food. Um, so I dredged the pickles in a batter that I actually made with elderflower cordial. So elderflower cordial, uh, fried garlic pickles. And that was like a fun appetizer. If you ever get to eat dinner at my house, it gets a little weird. And then also in winter, um, Florida Pelletory, this is a great wild green. I call it a volunteer plant because um, I will find it, I'll find it popping up in my yard in the winter time, and I'll also find it in flower pots. Um, it pops up at my local beach access that I walk by every day. Uh, I just kind of, when it's in season and it kind of starts to come out in January, lasts a couple of months, once I see it one place, I see it everywhere. The leaves taste like cucumber. Hands down, 100%, it tastes like a cucumber, so it's very nice to eat it fresh. And that's really nice in January and February after we've had all of our holiday food. We want something nice and fresh. And so I tried to keep it fresh. Um, I've used it um, to flavor those little layered dips. It's really wonderful in spring rolls. Um, I did blend it into a rice pilaf. And then my uh, little puppy sat in my lap while I made this and I promised that I would sneak him in here. And he loves Pelletory. Um, he'll browse it like a deer. All right, we'll move into spring, and I'm just going to keep baiting you with paw paw pictures. <laughs> You're never going to find one. Maybe you could buy one online or something. But in the springtime, um, the small flower paw paw puts on these really beautiful, uh, tiny maroon flowers. And if you happen to walk maybe at Hannah Park, or Fort Clinch, or any of the maritime hammocks um, in the early spring, you probably see some pawpaw flower. Something that we have an abundance of, and you can have, and I can have, and your neighbor can have, and you probably try to get it out of your yard or something, is Smilax, or I like to call it Greenbrier. I don't think Smilax sounds very nice. Greenbrier sounds pretty. And it's a really nice edible plant um, when it's not like jabbing you in the leg with its thorns or something. Um, and the springtime, the tips of it um, break off really easily. And I'm not telling you that they taste like asparagus, but it's a similar, it's a very pleasant, it's not bitter, it's not sour, it's just a very nice green. And the texture is similar to asparagus. And then if you have ever tried to rid your yard of smilax, you have probably found those roots up there in the corner. Well, another common name for smilax is sarsaparilla vine. And the roots can be used to make sarsaparilla flavored soda or syrup. And I have a photo of it there. So I use it, um, I like to find analogs, like wild food and then food that we're really familiar with. So like meadow garlic, it's a lot like an onion. Smilax to me is a lot like asparagus. So I pickled it, stir fry, put it in a quiche. And then the root, I won't explain this entire process, but that is um, the start of a Smilax root soda. And so I ruined a kitchen knife by chopping that root into small pieces. I put it in that glass jar, added some water, added some sugar, and then every day for five days, I added a little bit more Smilax and a little bit more sugar. And if you've ever done any fermentation, it came alive. And so all of those bubbles are naturally occurring. And then I use that to make like a Smilax orange soda. Yeah, see, foraging does not have to be like prepping or like survivalist. Like you don't have to like eat wild food just um, so that you survive zombie apocalypse. You can have fun with it. Uh, another prickly plant, I really have an affinity for prickly ones, is thistle or cerium heridulum. 
the entire plant is technically edible. If you have all day, you could clip all those tiny spines off of the leaves and you can cook the leaves like you cook collard greens or kale. I skipped that part, but you go straight to the compost. What I'm looking for is the interior stalk. So in the upper right-hand corner, that is a thistle stalk, completely cleaned and fresh. And another analog, I think it looks like celery, tastes a little bit like celery, and so I use it like celery. So cream of thistle soup, I've added it in gold shrimp, uh, and then this little corn chowder. It's a really fun one. If you don't want to eat thistle and one happens to come up in your yard, um, it's a host plant for the little metal mark and for painted lady butterflies. So it's a prickly little plant, but it's a nice pollinator plant to have. And then pine. Um, I've been having a lot, I've spent a lot of time with pine trees this year. And so I have it here, I think I have it in spring. The needles are available year round, it's evergreen. Um, they're very easy to find green pine needles on the ground after any like day of like pretty strong wind. Um, and the needles can be used, of course, you've probably heard of pine needle tea, but they can also use to make sodas, vinegars, you can use it as a seasoning. Um, and if you've never tasted a pine needle before, they taste a little bit citrusy. Pine has um, somewhat of a citrusy flavor to it. Um, but I have it here in spring because that's when you're going to find two other very valuable parts. First, you're going to find the very immature cones. Um, and at some point in the spring, they're going to be full of pollen. You're either have allergies or you find pine pollen all over your car or all over your clothes after a walk in the woods. But some people collect that pollen and then use it for baking. You can add it into breads and cakes and cookies. Um, and then a little bit further down the road, but still in spring, the green pine cones can be used to make a syrup. And I'm gonna take a little break here and I'm going to tell you real fast how to make pine cone syrup because it's the absolute very best thing that I made this whole entire year. Um, I made it a couple of months ago and I'm still like think about it every single day. It, it's really wonderful and I can't believe that like this isn't more of like a thing that people do here in the South. But find yourself some green pine cones. Again, you can find them on the ground after a strong wind in the spring. I collected all of these off. I think they're from slash pine. Any true pine you can do this with. But get the green cones, bring them home, rinse them off. Of course, you don't want dirt, you don't want little bugs or insects. But then you're going to shove them in a glass jar. And as you're shoving them in the jar, fill the jar with brown sugar. <laughs> and I use a little stick to really make sure that I got as much sugar in the jar as possible. So the first photo, the green cones. Second photo, that was the very first day. The third photo is the fifth day. The brown sugar is drawing out moisture from the cones and it's dissolving the sugar. But when sugar and water are in an airtight container, they'll start to ferment. So it also ferments. And then the last of so day five is the third one. The last photo, I actually let mine go for 70 days, but a month is fine. 30 days is fine. Leave it on your countertop for a month. Unscrew the lid every now and then to release the pressure because it's fermenting. And then at the end of the month, you have this beautiful homemade, for pennies, pine cone syrup. It tastes fantastic. And you could put it on pancakes. You could drizzle it on biscuits. You could put it over ice cream. Or in the corner, you could make pine cones here at Baklava. <laughs> and I, I recommend you do. Um, and wild pine soda, so pine needles, uh, cranberries, some orange there. Um, and then in the lower corner, that's a cranberry pine syllabub. It's another, um, like a dessert that I made with the wild pine soda. 
And I do a lot of fermenting. If you're not familiar with that and you want to ask me some questions about it after the presentation, I'd be happy to try to explain a little bit of it. And then mulberries. Has anybody here had wild mulberries? Oh my gosh, they're so good. And I don't know why mulberries aren't commercially packaged and sold in the grocery store, except they're a little bit fragile, but I don't think they're more fragile than blackberries or raspberries. And they taste so good. Of course, you can eat them fresh. They're wonderful straight from the tree, but just like any berry, they could make jams, compotes, syrups. You can pre oops, preserve them in honey. If you make jam, you can make mulberry pop tarts. Um, and then like the muscadines, if you juice your mulberries for any reason, if you're making syrup or anything that you would use juice for, you can take all of the pulp and the skin and anything that you had left over from juicing. You can infuse it in vinegar. You can infuse it in spirits, anything like that. Um, just a wonderful wild fruit that we have each year. And then moving on into summer, here's this photo of elderflower. Elderberry is probably the plant that I personally have foraged the most of. It was one of the first plants that I ever found or identified. Um, it grows very prolifically. Um, where I'm at, we're going to meet it on Sunday on Egan's Creek Greenway. We'll definitely see it in fruit. We might still even see it in flower. And the flowers and the fruit are both edible. Um, European traditions who make elderflower cordial from the flowers. Um, and then the fruit is the berry, has a really nice sort of tart flavor to it. Um, and it can be used anything that you would use a berry for. The flowers are typically used fresh, although you will hear about elderflower fritters. And I love fried fruit food. I don't know why you would take this flour and dip it in batter and then fry it because then you can't taste it. <laughs> and maybe that's why you would do it, but it's a really nice flavor. And so uh, the best way to capture it is to kind of make elderflower cordial with it or elderflower soda, or maybe infuse it into something. And then the fruit, you can eat elderberry raw. You won't die. I'm still standing here but there's a ton of seeds inside of it. So it's not the best sensory experience. It's really better if you juice it um, and then cook it and use it. Um, oh, these are elderflower things that I've done. Elderflower soda, cordial, uh, elderflower cordial donuts where I use the cordial in place of milk or water in a recipe. And um, because the cordial's fermented, it'll give you like a really great rise. You'll get a really soft, um, Adam, if you do some baking, the cordial, it'll get a really soft um, pastry. And then I always um, make some elderflower vinegar. And so that's actually elderflower uh, vinegar potato salad. Okay. And then berry. The um, possibilities are endless. You can make a million things with them. I, everything that it's going to have a really beautiful color to it. So you can, of course, make jelly, but then, like I said, I'd make a ton of vinegars. And so elderberry vinegar, and then I use that to pickle eggs with. And I got that beautiful purple pink um, color. Uh, elderberry juice mixed with coconut cream for some dessert bar. And then I don't let anything go to waste. If I'm going to go through the trouble of going out and harvesting a wild plant, I'm going to make sure that it's the most out of it. And so um, elderberry infused sugar with like some leftover skin and pulp from juicing the berries. And then cattails. Um, I told you I don't like to necessarily harvest roots of plants. I'm not very comfortable taking a plant out of the ground. Cattails are the one exception. Um, the flowers and the roots and the shoots are all edible. The reason it's an exception for me is that cattails could sometimes be seen as a nuisance. Um, municipalities and cities and stuff, um, they will clog up is in retention ponds and natural ponds and the edge of a lake. I mean, they 
grow prolifically. So you want to make sure that the water quality is really good where you're harvesting any root from. But if you do know the location, I don't feel bad taking a few because it's a prolific producer and they can get really thick. Um, and most people, when they hear about eating cattail or people think about cattail, I know you're probably thinking of that brown corn dog looking thing. That's way past edible. <laughs> um, and actually this, so this is a cattail blossom or a flower and it's open and in flower and the pollen's coming out. Um, you first want to try to find them when they're green. So when they're green like that, when they've just, they're kind of in bud and they haven't opened up yet, that green cattail shoot, it's corn. It has a very um, corn-like uh, flavor to it. And so you can roast those, you can boil them, you can bake them in your oven. But what I like to do with them is just shave the flowers off. So there's an inner core, it's pretty small, but it's pretty tough. And I'll just shave the flowers off and then use them like corn casserole, um, those are cattail flower fritters on the bottom, like a corn fritter or something. And then it's kind of hard to see, but the upper image, there's little tiny white circles. Those are the cattail shoots. They taste a lot like palm heart, maybe a little bit like an artichoke or something. It's a mild, pretty pleasant flavor. And then passion flower, um, everybody loves it. It's obviously one of our most beautiful wildflowers and very tropical looking. But the entire plant is edible. Uh, the flowers and the leaves are traditionally used for tea. Um, it produces an edible fruit. And then the Cherokee um, would take the leaves and they would blanch them or boil them and then they would fry them in hot oil and eat them that way. Um, and if you've ever bought any passion flower tea at the supermarket or a health food store, if you turn it over, I guarantee you it says Passiflora incarnata. It's this particular species. Um, and so the fruit, it's really nice um, when it's ripe. I like to just eat it fresh. And most of the time when you see it, it's green. That's not ripe. If it's green and you see it, it's not ripe. In the photo there, it's turned yellow and the skin's starting to wrinkle. That's when you are ready. So if you break it open, it looks like this on the inside. And every one of those little seeds comes with their own little juice pouch. And so you just pop those in your mouth and you squish them with your tongue and you get some really great passion flower juice. If you happen to find a bunch of them and if you've grown passion flower or you've ever seen it, you know that it can be pretty aggressive and it grows prolifically. So you might get a lot of fruit. Um, you could save it and freeze it. And then once you've gotten a bunch, you could juice it. And then cabbage palms. Um, I'm gonna talk about the flowers, but if you have ever read any historical book about Florida, whether it was fiction or nonfiction, you probably heard about eating swamp cabbage, um, which is the heart of our native cabbage palms. Um, the issue with swamp cabbage or eating the of the palm, and it tastes really good. Uh, it's just like the heart of palm that you buy at the store. One, it's super labor intensive. You have to take all of those boots off and you have to, I had to use a chainsaw <laughs> to get down into the interior. But it also, of course, kills the tree. Um, a way that you can enjoy cabbage palms is the flower heads. Every year, every tree puts on five or six or seven or eight very large um, flower spikes. And they can be eaten fresh or just like any other flower. You can use them to make sodas and vinegar. If you leave the flower, it will turn into a technically edible fruit that does not have very much flavor. It's kind of dry inside, doesn't have any juice. Um, so I just like to use the flowers. That is what the palm heart looks like. If you happen to have one that you want to get rid of or take out, you could um, get the palm. But I just like to use the blossoms and I make simple syrup with them and then use that to glaze pies and fresh fruit. Um, I put it on cornbread and then you can't see it, but 
That's a spicy palm blossom chicken sandwich. Um, and it was really great. And then the last flower that I want to talk about are our native yuccas or yuccas. This is a wonderful eating flower. Um, it's my second favorite flower. Hopness is the first one. But this one's really good. First of all, the texture is interesting. Um, you can, if you've ever touched them or if you have one, they're like kind of firm. They have like like sort of a substantial like texture to them. Um, they too taste a little bit like palm heart, a little bit like artichoke. I think they're great fresh. And they make these really cute little edible cups. So you can use them to fill um, with little appetizers or hors d'oeuvres, or you could deep fry them and you could have yucca flower fritters. Um, so those are the plants that I wanted to talk about tonight. Of course, I could stand here for three days and we could keep going. Um, <laughs> I just want to give you a little sample and make you think about a few that maybe hadn't thought of before. I know some really common ones that we all know. Um, Yes. So I know all of you are like, all right, you're like out there and you're about to start planting in the landscaping of the garden club. But um, I want you to know that I do collect wild plants, um, but all foragers, I think, I hope, are bound by ethics. Um, I'm a really big fan of Dr. Robin Welcomer. She is an indigenous person and a biologist. Um, and she wrote a wonderful book called Braiding Sweetgrass, but she is also a forager and she drafted what she calls the honorable harvest. And it's kind of guidelines or rules um, to follow when we're thinking about taking a wild plant or flower. Um, and I won't read them all to you, but what I will say is that foragers it's in our own best interest to be very respectful of the environment. So we don't want to go out and take all of anything that we see, even if we're not seeing very much. Um, a general rule of thumb that most people I know follow is anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, depending on the plant, of what's available directly in front of you. Of course, that means you need to know your plants and know the populations in your area. Like I said, something like elderberry, there's there must be thousands of elder bushes up near me. Um, something like a yucca, there's a lot of them, but not as many. And so you need to know each individual plant and be really familiar with your ecosystems and the habits of those plants. But I would be, you know, kind of shooting myself in the foot if I went and harvested everything that was available because then next year when I went, there wouldn't be anything there. And not only do I want there to be something there next year, I hope there's more. And I hope that there's something there in 20 years for my children. And I hope there's something there in a hundred years um, for my grandchildren. So I, th I think most of the time people are respectful and they're very grateful. And as you saw, I try to really use everything that I take. How to get started in your very own yard. Take a look around. Um, uh, Walter told me that he has a bunch of creeping cucumber in his yard, and Alice told me that she just found creeping cucumber in her yard. So I know we think we know our yard because it's the place we like see every single day, but new plants pop up there all the time or something that you just haven't really paid attention to before. So start in your own yard and then slowly start to maybe glance over at your neighbor's yard because they don't want their wild food. They're creeped out by it, trust me. So just ask them if you can have it. <laughs> And then, you know, just expand from there. You don't have to go out into some pristine natural area an hour from your house to harvest wild food. Um, I do live in a small area, but I, the probably 90% of the plants that I harvest come within like 10 miles of my house. Um, it's all like a very urban residential area. And then a few resources. Um, 
Florida's Edible Wild Plants is a small, very affordable book. That's a good start into our edible plants. Um, a favorite of mine is a book called Forage Harvest Feast. The author actually lives in New York City, but she's very knowledgeable about wild plants and we share a lot of similar species. Uh, and then a book called Florida Ethnobotany. There's a website called eattheweeds.com. Um, Green Dean has explored and written about edible food in Florida for many, many years. And I think that he's coming out with a book um, this coming year as well. But that's a free online site that you can look at. And then if you happen to be on Instagram and you want to keep up with what I'm doing, you can follow me at that's Paris. And my last slide, I'm not going to read it to you, but it's a quote from one of my favorite authors, Janice Ray. Uh, she also is a forager, and she wrote this quote about a particular meal that she enjoyed. Um, and I'll leave it up there and ask if there are any questions. Okay, thank you. No questions? Okay. <laughs> okay, in the back. The cabbage palm that is the swamp cabbage. Yes. What does um, swamp cabbage or heart of palm taste like? It tastes just like heart of palm that you buy at the grocery store, which is to me very similar to like an artichoke or it's a really mild, very pleasant vegetable flavor, um, but not particularly strong at all. The flowers have a really sweet scent to them. They're very, very sweet. And so you get, um, if you eat the flowers raw, you get like a nectar, you know, just like if you sipped on honeysuckle or something, you'll get like a little sweet nectary flavor. Oh, no, go ahead. And that's a go through the whole list. Yeah. I didn't, I just seal it and let it ferment. I do not add sugar but unscrew the jar once a day to let pressure out. Um, and then Diana. Are there any cautions um, on, any, on any of the plants that I featured? No. And so I didn't talk about things like pokeweed or um, a few other plants that maybe you need to take a little bit more um, research. The only caution was most people recommend that you hook elderberries before you consume them. I don't think that's necessary, but I don't know why you wouldn't cook them. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't talk about beautyberry. Um, and I wouldn't eat any unripe fruit. So it is important to know, be like intimately aware of the plants. And maybe the first time that you notice a plant, and I call it meeting a plant, the first time that you like the first time you see beautyberry, you probably noticed it when it was bright pink and purple and beautiful. But be patient and maybe don't harvest it that year maybe watch the whole entire cycle and get to really understand um, the plant from if it goes dormant or whether it's evergreen, but how it acts throughout the whole year. But typically any unripe fruit is not going to be um, the best experience. Adam? I have not. Um, Oh, have I ever tried anything with saw palmetto, um, whether the flowers or the berries, or even you can eat the heart of saw palmetto as well. But I personally have not, you know, so saw palmetto fruit um, is regulated and protected in Florida. Um, it's, I've heard that it does not taste good anyway, but um, that's a very popular um, supplement in the like healthcare industry. And so it's regulated in Florida. It's actually against the law to harvest salt palmetto fruit without a permit from the state, even on private land, even on your own land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really weird. Ellen. Thanks. Okay. 
Tyler is gorgeous. <laughs> um, so Ellen's kind of asking how I keep track of what's happening in my kitchen because I have a lot of different things going at one time whether it's infusing something or fermenting something um, and it's not always pretty but I label everything um, so the jars um, for the photos they don't but the jars have little labels on them that say like started this muscadine vinegar on August 4th or um, this pine cone syrup on this date. Um, every now and then one escapes me and I have to do a little taste test, but for the, for the most part, I'm keeping track of what I happen to have going on. And then. Oh, anything obscure. I I so I have had Papa and if you I'll just really quickly so is there anything obscure that I wanted to find and Ellen jokes about the Papa so I've tasted wild Papa it's delicious it's absolutely wonderful it took me seven years of, and I know exactly where they're at I've known the whole time every year I visit them and I watch them flower and I watch them fruit and I'm like this is my year um and then every year I like go and one day, so pawpaw fruit will not ripen on your counter. It has to ripen on the tree. And one day you'll go and it's like rock hard. And then it'll go back the next day and there'll be a big bite out of it. Because mm -hmm. um, the animals will eat it when it's not. Um, I can't think of anything obscure, like right off the top of my head. Um, a plant I didn't talk about was poke and poke weed. And I'm going to talk about that a lot this coming year because I think it's a great wild edible. And that's one that's kind of gotten a bad rap as potentially being poisonous or toxic. And yes, you need to prepare it correctly. But if you do, it is an excellent eating green. It tastes a lot like spinach. Um, and I actually think that a lot of the sort of advisories and caution around it are way overblown. And I think what it is is that we've stopped eating it. And so then when we stop eating it, foods sort of come taboo or they develop folklore and mythology. I think Poke's one of them. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Do I share my recipes? Um, she was asking if I share my recipes like online or anything. Um, yes, and no, if I have one, I typically am happy to share it with you. I was telling Adam beforehand, um, I'm not that great at actually take it. That's where I fail is like writing down what I'm doing. I kind of just go by feel or um, so I need to do better at measuring as I'm going. I'm kind of just playing around. But yes, I do. Um, if you happen to be on Instagram, I share stuff and I'll share recipes or you can ask me for it. I'd be happy to give it to you if I know what it is. Yes. Um, Abby wanted to know how long the pine cone syrup will keep. I think it'll keep in your refrigerator for like six months because it's got a good amount of sugar in it and sugar is a good preservative. Um, but also you can water bath process it. You can can and seal the bar that way. Um, and there's plenty of sugar in there and then you could keep it in your pantry um, until you are ready to use it. Yeah, yeah. So I just made one batch this year and next year I'm making like gallons of this stuff. I mean, you're all getting pine cones here for Christmas next year. It is not, no, um, it does ferment, but it's not alcoholic. Once the, um, what it is is that this sugar is eating the microbes on the pine cones. And once they've done, the process is over. I don't let it um, have exposure to air. And that's what probably would, if it did become alcoholic, it would be through air exposure. I love talking about pine cone syrup. Yeah. No difference. I just, so 30 days will get you from start to finish. 
I happened to start it at my very busiest time of year and I literally just did not have time to strain it. So I thought, I'm just going to let it go for 70 days and see what happens. And it was fine and it was great. So. When you're out foraging, is there a particular like that might be for that? Like, um, Jolie asked if there was a particular type of container that I would use to forage with. And that's totally dependent on what you are foraging. And so keep if you're foraging, one time I went foraging with one of those recyclable Publix bag, cloth ones that you get your groceries in, but I got elderberry and I carried it on my back. And then I had a nice big elderberry stain right here um, that I wasn't initially aware of. Um, but it kind of depends on what you're foraging for. Um, but I typically just carry like a canvas bag or um, something like that. Um, yeah. Okay, so maybe have I ever eaten choke cherry or aronia fruit? Um, that would be one that I would love to catch. No, I haven't. And that would be a really nice one. Um, yeah, I'm not sure because I know that people love eating them. Um, and I know where some are, but I haven't caught it in fruit. <laughs> yes. Kate. Kate wanted to know if we have the references I listed in the Ixia library. I'm sure that we have Florida's edible wild plants. Um, we probably don't have the other ones. One of them I wouldn't recommend because she is based in New York. Um, and then the other one, that would be a great book for the library, Florida Ethnobotany, but it's very expensive. It's like a textbook. It's like a college textbook. I think I paid almost $200 for it. Uh, it's an investment, but it's worth it. Florida Ethnobotany is this gigantic book. It's really thick, but um, it was written by Dan Austin when he worked, I think at USF or something. Um, it is basically a record of every known plant in the state that was used by indigenous people. So he doesn't give you recipes. He doesn't tell you what to do with it at all because the book's so large, but that's kind of, it's like a rabbit hole. You like see that, okay, this plant was used for this and then you gotta go figure out how um, to do it. <laughs> Any other questions? Kate. Yes. Yeah, that's not true. Is that just not true? Um, Kate wants to know if Yalpon Holly, why it has the um, botanical name Ilex vomitoria. Um, it does not make you vomit. It absolutely is not true. It's a terrible misnomer. Um, there's a couple different theories that I've heard. One. It, the first theory that I've heard is that indigenous people would brew it um, in a ceremony, but they would brew it so strong and so intense, and they would consume so much of it that they were recorded vomiting after using it. Um, another theory that I've also heard is that they were actually using um, gallberry. Ilex globla, globra, um, not Yalpon. Um, but one, Yalpon is sold commercially. There's several different suppliers. Um, you can purchase it at stores now. The Yalpon brothers um, harvest it in Texas and across the country. But I've drank in tons of it. I've never even felt any bad effects. The one thing about Yalpon, it's one of the only, if not the only caffeinated, naturally caffeinated plant in North America. And it's an incredibly high amount of caffeine that the plant contains. So you actually don't need a large dose of it to make like a pitcher of iced tea. You only need like a tablespoon. Uh, yes. There you go. <laughs> there you go.
uh, the last they would drink it and drink it and the person who did it, the last person to vomit was the chief so the one who could drink the most of it without vomit got to be the chief i hadn't heard that one but it it's just an unfortunate name for a very nice um native plant and i actually think that all of the ilexes can be used for tea so yalpon and dahoon and even american holly could also be used if you were inclined all right well thank you everybody for coming and seeing my presentation that was a lot of fun. I know. All right. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Walter. Perfect. No, not, not edible. Yeah. Yeah. I got to get married so long. Alfred got me a female. Well, my female now is big enough. She's got berries. Probably get some cedar wax. Well, it's the cedar wax. I have a loquat that just died, and I usually get cedar wax when it's all over the loquats, eating that. It's going to die. So, that's really.